Thank you so much for uh, these chapel times. You know, our worship in the morning begins as you walk in and you come in quietly and take seats and begin to reflect and be quiet. And then that is the beginning of our worship. And then people like Bethany carry us forth in beautiful sounds from the piano. And then we sing and we come to the, the word. That's all part of our worship to this credible Jesus that we love and serve. I remember my early times in chapels in Chehi Summer School in its early years back in Muncie, Pennsylvania. It was there that I first heard Gladys Chehi and Wilmus and they, many of you might know, they had a wonderful soprano that traveled with them and sang. Her name was Adi, Adi Serpki, German descent. And it was at a chapel like this that I first heard an old gospel song that they did many times. And it went something like this. I knelt beside a dying bed where lay a child with aching head waiting for Jesus' call. I marked his smile, twas sweet as May, and as his spirit passed away, he whispered, Christ is all. Christ is all, he is all in all. Yes, Christ is all in all. Christ is all, he is all in all. Yes, Christ is all in all. Then come to Christ, O oh come today, the Father, Son, and Spirit say, the Bride repeats the call. He'll give you life, He'll give you stay, He'll take your guilty stains away, for Christ is all in all. Christ is all, he's all in all. Yes, Christ is all in all. Christ is all, he's all in all. Yes, Christ is all and in all. First heard that with Gladys rippling away, an Adi screeching high soprano, three or four changes of key, <laughs> and Wilmus improvising like mad and just glorious sounds. Of course, the constant refrain of that old gospel song is the strong and open declaration that Christ is all and in all. And that gospel song comes from the very center point of our text for this morning from Colossians for today. As you see here, Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 17. So let's turn to that and read that together. <clears throat> I'm going to be reading from a my own translation, I've just made a few changes that I think are a little bit better nuanced, nothing major, nothing heretical, just <laughs> actually more accurate. So it may differ just a wee bit from yours, but uh, it'll be very close. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 to 17. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. All of that, by the way, comes under grammatically idolatry is kind of the umbrella of those things. 
Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourself of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your mouth. Do not lie to each other, since you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge in accordance with the image of its creator. A renewal in which there is neither Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any one of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all, Over all these virtues, put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms and hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. In uh, Paul's letter to these Colossians, he now develops a section that could best be summarized, I think, as living a Christocentric life. Which is to say, living in such a way that your life is entirely centered on Jesus Christ. A Christocentric posture. And the apex of it is here. At the very center point, in fact, of this passage, at the end of verse 11, in which we can almost hear the apostle shout it out, or perhaps as I have tried to sing it out, Christ is all and in all. It is bespeaking a life in which Christ is everything. This superlative, have you noticed through the letter of the Colossians, this superlative all, how many times it comes in related to Jesus. There is not room for any wriggling with a term like all. He is all. Not a little bit, not partially, not halfway, not three quarters. He is everything. Christ is all and is in all. This is the emphasis in the original language of the text, ta panta kai en pasin Christos. Literally, that reads, ta panta kai en pasin Christos. The all is Christ, and in all is Christ. Or even more literally, the all and the in all Jesus is. Christ is. Well, in other words, I think there are two angles to this, clearly from this central statement. The first, in which it is saying something along the order of, Christ is the Summa for those who follow him. When I was in college student I just really didn't have my head together. I never thought about grades, and it was surprising to me when I got to graduation and saw friends graduating summa cum laude. <laughs> and I would never even thought about that. No, I didn't get that. <laughs> a little below that. Just a wee bit. But not the all. 
Summa is all. It's the top, isn't it? Christ is the summa. When you come to graduation from your college years, grand if you have summa cum laude. But in the school of Jesus, even more so, I hope you graduate summa, Christ Jesus is Lord. It's giving special attention to the article ta, ta panta, Christ is the all. Where it is clearly objective. He is the all. To affirm the all-encompassing everything as in the objective stature of Christ in God's ordering of the world. He is Summa. As Christians, we have the great privilege. Our life is all about Christ who is Summa. He's over and above everything. Claim that Christ is all is briefly to reiterate the very high Christology that Paul has set forth earlier back in chapter 1 that we read that great hymn of Christ. And the second angle to this, which is understandably more subjective and more relational and more sociological, in fact, is referring clearly to the presence of Christ in all. Christ is all. He is in all that renders anything as meaningful because Christ's presence makes it meaningful. And this is particularly so in terms of meaning derived from human relationships. As the beginning of verse 11 is clearly trying to bring to our attention. So if you'll read that with me, in fact, back up to verse 10. You've put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in accordance with the image of its creator, a renewal, and now there's all these lists of humanly defined roles in which there is neither Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Paul's point here is that when Christ is truly all and we see the potential in all human beings that Christ can take up residence within them, then we're not talking about humanly devised systems in which now it is not about ethnic divisions, Greek and Jew, and in which it is not about religious divisions, circumcised and uncircumcised, and in which it is not about civil divisions, barbarian and Scythian, and in which it is not about class division, slaves, or free ones. As Ben Witherington, wonderful scholar, puts it, Paul means at the very least that these distinctions no longer determine who is among God's people. These distinctions no longer have any soteriological weight. Soteriology is the I whole teaching in the Bible about salvation. God's saving purposes have nothing to do with human status or the lack of it or human restrictions based on the divisions we create by class, status, civil role, even religion. None of these define human identity, and therefore none of these define human meaning, but it is about the presence of Christ potentially in any group of people, whether they're Greek or Jew. That was hugely radical in Paul's day. Whether or not they are circumcised or uncircumcised, a religious distinction, whether or not they are civilly organized as barbarians, the lowest of the low, or the Scythians, the very elite, posh. The, the Scythians would be the posh Londoners of today. 
who cock their wee finger when they have a cup of tea. <laughs> and it is not about class divisions, whether the slaves, the poorest of the poor, and the free, the wealthy. It's about the presence of Christ, regardless of all the variety of ethnic, religious, civil, and class divisions that are humanly construed that gives meaning to all human identity. Meaning comes because Christ is all. And all of those groups of people can experience potentially the presence of Christ. James Dunn says, if Christ is everything and in everything, then nothing can diminish or disparage the standing of any one human in relation to another or in relation to God. In our world today, racism is still rife. In our world today, class divisions and ethnic divides. In the very church that comes into my home, of all Muslim background people, there's all sorts of divisions amongst them, whether they're Shiite or Sunni background creates all sorts of problems for us within Islam background itself. So on this basis, young women, young men, here at Che, I must put this question to you as Paul's letter brings it to us here. Is Christ the Summa in your life? Is Christ everything to you? It's one thing to declare he's the summa of the cosmos. He's the summa of humanity. But is he summa for you? And the further question, is the presence of Christ redefining all human relations in and around you? such that Jesus himself overshadows any and all humanly construed divisions. Christ himself forming the basis of identity and thus giving meaning to anyone, anyone. Radically regardless I'd like you to take that little phrase away today. Radically regardless of ethnic, religious, civil, class distinctions by which the world, apart from God, determines who is and who is not important. In Christ, those have no meaning. Our world around us, apart from God, on the basis of all these distinctions, determines who is important and who is not. And God in Christ says, that's all rubbish. Christ is all. Ta panta kai and pasen Christos Christ is all and in all. Well, I think chapter 3 then, the next set of verses, verses 12 to 17 of this Colossian letter from Paul, then gives us a picture of what living looks like when indeed Christ is all what living actually behaves like and looks like. And according to the grammar and the thematic flow of the remaining portion of our passage, we can list them as four that affirm, again, a totally Christ-centered, Christocentric approach to living. Thus, in verses 12 to 17, we are given the various pictures. The first is the clothing of Christ. They're all Christocentric. The second is the peace of Christ. The third is the word of Christ. And the fourth is the name of Christ. 
So first, we're given a very vivid picture by way of the metaphor of clothing. What we put on is a daily wardrobe in verses 12 to 14. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves. If Christ is summa, clothe yourselves with compassion with kindness, with humility, with gentleness, with patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any one of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. This language of put on is all through the Greek world language of clothing what you dress in, how you present yourself, your identity formed not by your uniform, but by how Jesus uh, comes through in your daily life. This argument is prefaced, of course, earlier in the passage, verses 5 to 9, with an exhortation that's very negative, the negative side of it, An exhortation that is deliberately dramatic and drastic, nothing less than to kill self-centeredness, which invokes nothing less, Paul says, than the wrath of God. Augustine put it so well, sin is love distorted. The essence of sin is idolatry, according to the Bible. And idolatry takes good things and distorts them out of proportion. So that sex is a good thing in God's order, but when it becomes an idol, it's love that's distorted. Money is a good thing, but when it's distorted, it becomes abusive. Greed, as he lists here, and all of these things that come out of sin that is love distorted. But here in verses 12 to 14 is the very positive side of a Christ-likeness in terms of an attractive identity, a wardrobe. And it is clear, by the way, you know how what you wear really has something to say about your identity. I used to think, I didn't care anything about the clothing I wear. But that was my identity, that I didn't care about it. (laughs) Others around me were very particular about what they wore. Did you think carefully about what you put on today? Like, who's going to see this, who's not? If, If you didn't, you're like me, well, even that's an identity statement. And then we have identity statements based in our clothing all in our world. The, you go to the hospital and a doctor in a white robe has some sense of authority to you. Or a policeman in a police uniform or soldiers in army attire or whatever it might be. Clothing is associated whether you like it or not with identity and certainly it was in the New Testament world where divisions of people The Jewish people were very proud, and so they wore particular things that distinguished them from the Greeks, which is why Paul says there is neither Greek or Jew. Christ is all. Put on Christ. It's clear that Paul is echoing earlier work in Galatians, for example, chapter 3, verse 27, in which the apostle explicitly suggests that the clothing of Christ is Christ himself. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And also in Romans 13, verse 14, in which the same metaphorical uh, language of How we clothe ourselves is used by Paul again. He says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thus, the person whose life attests to the fact that Christ is all is literally, verily, metaphorically clothed in compassion, 
kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, and ultimately the grand umbrella of it all, epi pasen de tutos ten agapen. Epi pasen, over all these things, make it love, put on love, agape love. Not love that's distorted, but love that gives yourself away, like Jesus did. Secondly, such a person is ruled by the peace of Christ. Verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. This is the New Testament version, Erene, of the Hebrew Shalom. Thus, it's not meaning simply a peaceful kind of feeling in the midst of stress, although it includes that, but it's much bigger than that. It's all that contributes to holistic well-being that flows out of a healthy relationship with God and a healthy relationship with people around you and a healthy relationship even with the created world. That is shalom. The key idea is the verbal aspect that for such a person who has Christ as all, that shalom virtually governs, rules one's life. Everything is umpired through the grid of God's overriding concern to bring shalom. Which is why Jesus is titled by Isaiah the prophet, he is the prince of what? Shalom, peace. He is the wonderful counselor, the everlasting father, the almighty God, the prince of shalom. That's Christ. Thirdly, <clears throat> when Christ is all, young Men, young women, hear me very important on this. The word of Christ is vitally important. Verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell among you richly. So much so that it infills how you admonish one another with wisdom. How it infills your psalms your worship songs, and the songs in your hearts that spring up out of the Spirit, how it infills your singing unto the Lord, your music making coming out of your commitment to this word of Christ. <clears throat> well, how are we to understand this? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. To get at it, I'm going to teach you an academic reference <laughs> with which minimally you can at least impress your friends when you go home, okay? <laughs> or each other, if you can quote this throughout the rest of the day. It's a little academic reference that will say to somebody, oh, wow, he's kind of knowledgeable. <laughs> this phrase, the word of Christ, is technically called an hapex legomenon. Can you try that with me? Just say that. Hapex legomenon. Hapex legomenon. Anybody know what a hapex legomenon is? It's like typical school. It, it takes a very simple idea and makes it complicated. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody know? Hapex legomenon is a Greek-based form by which to say simply that something only occurs once. It's a saying, legomenon, from logos, something spoken, that is hapex, it has one occurrence. And in the Bible, when you come to something that is hapex, legomenon, it's really important because it's there only once. And the opposite is true as well. When something is repeated over and over and over, like in music, if you have a motif that comes through over and over and over, you say, well, this composer was obviously wanting to get that across. 
But in scriptural study, when something is hapex legomenon, it says to scholars and students, and when you read thoroughly, wow, it's only there once, it must be really important. This is a hapex legomenon, the word of Christ. This is the only place in the entire New Testament it's the only place in the entire Bible where that phrase, the Word of Christ, appears. We have the Word of God many places, but the Word of Christ. Such rarity lends, of course, to its importance. Ho logos tu Christos, the Word of Christ. Thus, it very likely means, one, the Word or Gospel of which Christ is the content, the word about Christ, the word of Christ. And it can mean the word which Christ himself spoke, the word of Christ given out, the vital message of Jesus for the world, probably highlighting the kingdom of God message, which was Jesus' constant refrain, wasn't it? The kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom of God is here. Repent and believe. Paul suggests that for people for whom Christ is all, this commitment to the word of Christ is of inestimable, inestimable value. And thus he suggests that it should dwell in us his term is an economic one, richly. It's not really a, an emotive one. You know, you can talk about rich food. It doesn't mean it necessarily expensive. It just tastes rich. But this is purely an economic term. It should dwell in us richly as something that is rightfully expensive to which we assign huge and high value. And again, young men of Che, young women of Che, I want to stress just how important this is in my estimation. Europe, where I live and work, is more and more spiritually dead because the churches are less and less concerned with the word of Christ. When you lose the word of Christ, death ensues. That word, which is Christ, the content of the gospel, Jesus himself, and that word of Christ, his message to the world, God's kingdom is here. Live in accord with the kingdom agenda. Repent of the way you've been doing it. Believe the kingdom, the rulership, the, the reign of God over all. The message of Jesus. When Christ is all, then the fact that Christ is the content of our message and the message of Christ is the essence of that word we proclaim. And this word of Christ takes on paramount importance such that we assign it the very highest value in what we are all about. I really am so glad to tell you that in my experience at Chehi, I not only got a really high level of musical training, but I was exposed to the importance of the Word of Christ. A gospel that was centered in, this is about Jesus. A gospel that was His message to the world, God's kingdom is here in me. It begins in me. His death and all that it brings and his resurrection that vindicates victory, not defeat, is the commencing of this kingdom that you and I are a part of. And so, when you make music, think in yourself, I am celebrating this message. The kingdom is here. And I'm part of it. I love that prayer of Jesus again. I just reinforce it. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. 
on earth. Here. Not when you die and you go away to ethereal clouds and harps. But now, here, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That's the message of Jesus. And everything we do contributes to that. So those people for whom Christ is all and in everything, Christ infuses everything we do, say this word of Christ is to be richly held. It's the highest value. Don't let it become less. The fourth one we do all in the name of Christ. I'm just going to invite you to come talk to me about it. Because <laughs> we're running out of time. <clears throat> it's so important though, isn't it? Do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. But it's packed with a lot. I won't have time. Uh, if you're interested, I'd be glad to talk to you about that over coffee or... If you buy me a coffee in that little one downstairs where it's good coffee. <laughs> but otherwise, no, no. <laughs> uh, I'd love to chat with you. To conclude then, two things that I can conclude with that are in the text, grammatically in the language of the text, that are made emphatic. And so we can't leave without mentioning them just briefly. Two things made emphatic. One is, did you notice that there are three references to what? Be thankful. The end of verse 15, and be thankful. The end of verse 16, with gratitude in your hearts. The end of verse 17, giving thanks to God the Father through him. There is something about that person for whom Christ is all. That in the midst of hard stuff even, they say, thanks be to God from whom all blessings flow. Paul does not teach to give thanks for everything. He doesn't tell you to thank him that your dear loved one died or that the economy has collapsed and your family is really struggling. You don't thank him for the presence of the, the, the results of sin and evil in our world. You don't thank him for them, but we are encouraged to thank in the midst of everything. Give thanks in. And the person for whom Christ is all is able to do that. And that, that's a challenge to me. I know in my work I really get discouraged sometimes and I've been challenged. I just need to come back to what am I saying thank you for today? All through the day. Yeah? Anybody struggling today? Make a list of what you could be thankful for and just speak it out to the Lord. The last, the second emphatic point in the text is that in the middle of this is verse 14 that does put this overall epi pasen de tutois ten agape over everything put on love and so I'll conclude with a story of dear Uncle Wilmus this man like Sam Shu, in spite of all his gifts, what defined him was, especially as he thought about Chehi students, was he just loved us. He just kind of oozed with love. So I remember, as I said the opening night, I, I was so part of Chehi that I would come days early and help set everything up. And then the most memorable was after it was all over and all the, la the counselors had left and all the faculty and the staff and kitchen help. We had our own kitchen there. And uh, I would stay two or three extra days just to help sort. Not because I enjoyed the work. <laughs> I just wanted to be around Wilmus Chehi. And three or four summers in a row like that, I would be with him the days when it concluded. 
And he was the most depressed human being you could imagine. We would walk around and, you know, sort boxes here and help close up stuff there and gather all his music that had kind of disappeared around the camp. And he would walk like this and he'd be hung over and he'd kick the dirt with his feet because he just could hardly bear that all these students were gone for another year. And he said to me one time, Wes, I love them so much it hurts me. Put on love over everything. I learned that from Wilmus Chahi. That's the heritage you have here. You are loved because Christ is all. Not just arbitrarily, you know, my emotional love, but because Jesus is all to Wilmus and Sam and all these people that invest in Chehi, they love you. They weep when you have struggles. So keep that in mind. Wilmus walking around kicking the dirt like, what do I do? I love them so much it hurts. Christ is all. And in all, he's the Summa. Thank you, Lord. Bless this day. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.